Welcome to this uh, on seminar uh, on roadmaps. Uh, I'm Dr. Jonathan Ratcliffe. I'm a professor of energy systems at the University of Birmingham. Uh, I'm also a member of the uh, energy storage TCP. Uh, I'm the alternate delegate for the UK, uh, supporting colleagues in the government on the uh, on the executive committee. Uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, describe a bit about the roadmap that uh, I helped develop in the UK, uh, and it's specifically around research and innovation. And I'll just describe uh, a little bit about uh, both the process and, and the approach that we took to developing the, the roadmap, what, what it's for. Uh, then I'll describe a, a few of the findings. I won't go into a lot of detail around the uh, exact uh, uh, analysis that, that we did, but just to give you a bit of a flavour of that, and then uh, what some of the outputs from the roadmap were in terms of how we present it uh, and the sort of information that, that we're seeking to give uh, to uh, to various stakeholders. So I'll, I'll take us through uh, that, that sort of uh, outline there. Uh, so I suppose, first of all, uh, we, we, we developed this in uh, 2020 as funded through the uh, Research Council project, uh, what we have as an energy storage supergen hub in the UK. And uh, the supergens are uh, mechanisms through which we bring together the research community in the UK. Uh, and there's this one specifically on energy storage, others focus on uh, perhaps wind energy or uh, energy networks and so on. Uh, so it's very much a research-led roadmap. It's it's not one that's been developed uh, by government uh, or funded by government, and it's not specifically around policy. Although that's something that we do uh, look at through this through this roadmap. Uh, but we've used it to uh, both engage and inform decision makers, uh, both within industry uh, and and government. Uh, and also the funding agencies as well. So to, to give some uh, ideas around where we see uh, the role for energy storage changing over the next uh, few years uh, and to provide th those insights from the, the academic uh, research base. Uh, and I think it's also useful as a way of developing some of these shared visions for energy storage as well as, as, well as just the output uh, just the process of going through this sort of exercise, I think, really brings people together in a field that, that can be quite disparate uh, and uh, potentially fragmented uh, as well, as it's a relatively new community that's uh, that's been formed, especially if we look back over the last five or ten years. Uh, and also, it, it can help inform uh, not just the sort of experts uh, around energy systems, but those who are maybe connected in, in different areas, uh, maybe in uh, sort of buildings uh, related energy areas or transport, for example, and, and see how there are connections uh, across the sectors. Uh, and the scope was around uh, energy storage in uh, in quite general terms and, and broadly put, uh, think about electrical and thermal energy storage uh, and considering both the technical and non-technological challenges to uh, to research innovation, uh, but specifically within the UK. So I'm giving you that sort of UK focus, although we drew on uh, analysis from uh, from international uh, sources as well. So first of all, I mean, thinking about what what a roadmap is and and what it's for. I sort of yeah imagine a roadmap, uh, you know quite literally in, in this figure. Um, so uh, you can see uh, where, where I work at the University of Birmingham here, we're uh, a few a few kilometers south of the uh, city center. So if I want to go from my work to my favorite Chinese restaurant up in the town, uh, I can look at Google Maps. Uh, and first of all, I, I can see what the environment looks like. And I can see you know, this map, uh, there are different routes of getting there. Uh, and each has got, you know, there, there are potentially di different pathways of getting there as well. Uh, and I can use this information to make decisions, you know, either at the beginning uh, or when I'm on the train or bus. Yeah, you know, if something goes wrong or unexpectedly, then, then I can have a look at the map, you know, see what other routes there are, and you know, if there are better ways of doing it, maybe getting off, uh, changing modes, 
uh, then, then I've got this information. So if I can construct this sort of roadmap uh, at, at the beginning, then as we progress through the journey to, to this endpoint, then I've got the right sort of analysis that will help me make decisions. And, and during that process, uh, during that journey, I can yeah, continue this analysis as well and improve uh, the information that, that's feeding into what, what I'm going to do later on in the journey. So, so that's sort of how I conceptualize uh, roadmaps. It's, it's about informing, it's not being very prescriptive and saying, you know, we're here, we want to get to 2050. Uh, this is how things are going to change and this is what energy storage is going to do. We, we can't really understand that at the moment, we don't have all the information. There's a lot of uncertainty, uh, and it's a very dynamic environment, and it will be affected by other parts of the energy system as well. Yeah, so, and as we'll see, you know, perhaps how the rollout of uh, wind energy or solar uh, will change, uh, and that will have an impact on the role for, for energy storage. So yeah, I think it's really important to, to understand what we're trying to do from these roadmaps. Uh, and the, the approach that, that we took then uh, was to sort of break it down. First of all, thinking about the energy system need and, and what that transition uh, you know, could look like. Uh, you know, in broad terms, but we're moving towards uh, net zero by, by 2050, uh, and there'll be an increased role for uh, renewables uh, that will be changing you know, the the, uh, the the need to have flexibility. So so we expect uh, yeah this as being a, a, a real driver for for storage, uh, and then yeah that there'll be some uh, market mechanisms that that will uh, be needed as as we uh, as we seek to deploy storage uh, and support that uh, continued investment in the later stages of of innovation. Uh, and we're also thinking about the research and yeah, how UK research uh, can support those, those technologies that, that look as though they might have a role into the future, uh, what we need to do to address some of the uh, challenges uh, around the cost and performance of those technologies, uh, given how they're, they're being funded at, at different points uh, along, the, along the journey. And you know, perhaps, you know, considering what, what else we need to do uh, to make sure that we're ready in the future uh, for those changes to the energy system. Uh, and also at, at another level, you know, if we can see how different technologies uh, might be needed in the future, we can think about, well, you know, how that impacts on the uh, manufacturing and uh, sort of industry but within the UK. Uh, so that we can be providing that and you know, de delivering back to the uh, to the national economy, uh, and and, th and that's been a real driver uh, for a lot of these new new technologies, not just within the energy space, but you know what what, what are the uh, what, what are the opportunities for the the national economy? The, the sort of process that that we took then to. Uh, under better understand that uh, was firstly looking at the energy systems uh, analysis uh, so that we can uh, you know really map out you know, ha have a good view of that uh, wider environment in which energy storage uh, could be playing uh, a role uh, and there are a lot of scenarios out there that, that you know think about that and I'll give a quick description of, of some of those. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, the more technological side uh, of energy storage, uh, considering what uh, what stage in development the different technologies are at, uh, how their costs might be changing, and and the uh, how the performance might might be improving over over time. And and we drew that analysis uh, both from a sort of desk based study uh, looking at academic publications. Uh, but also the, the grey literature, which tends to be maybe a bit more current uh, in this sort of fast moving space. So there's a lot of reports that, that come from industry bodies, uh, from government uh, and uh, and other uh, maybe academic organisations uh, or learned societies. So we, we drew on that uh, and then we brought in uh, some more expert uh, analysis. So we, we had individual discussions and workshops 
so we had formed some of this analysis and then test it with uh, with people uh, from both academia and and the private sector in a dedicated uh, workshop. Uh, and then we used our own analysis uh, to construct the, the roadmap uh, based on all this all, all these findings. Um, just um, a sort of brief look at you know, how we uh, used the used the workshop. We, we brought together uh, you know, 20, 20 experts from from across the field, uh, and then asked them to look at our initial analysis around the systems and the technologies. Uh, and pose specific questions to them so that we could el elucidate uh, some of their knowledge, uh, both on how the how they think the system will will change and the role for energy storage, uh, and then uh, how the energy storage technologies uh, might be evolving themselves. Uh, and, and so we we were able to really get uh, a, a good understanding about both the system and the technologies. So to give you uh, a quick view of you know, some of what, what we found, I'll just have a look at uh, the, the systems uh, or the energy system itself uh, within the UK. I'll just flash up some uh, diagrams to, to give you uh, a feel for that. But first of all, looking at the demand side, uh, we, we drew on uh, three different bodies that are producing scenarios in the UK. Uh, first of all, from National Grid, the energy system operator, uh, the energy systems catapult uh, and uh, the government. And you can see the uh, references at the bottom there and then overlaid um, you know, what, what they were thinking, first of all, in terms of electrical demand in the UK. And from this diagram, you can see that the overall electrical demand is expected to increase through the 2030s and out to 2050 uh, as uh, electricity is, is used more to provide uh, transport and heat. So we've seen a decline in energy, uh, electrical energy demand over the last 10 or 20 years, but that's that will probably turn up as we decarbonize electricity and use that uh, to decarbonize other sectors. And then on the supply side, again, looking at uh, this range of, of scenarios, we can see fairly common uh, features that, that show the amount of flexible generation dropping quite significantly, yeah, maybe by a half over the next 10 years as we retire a lot of gas-powered stations, especially and replace that with more variable generation from wind and solar as we go out to 2050. Yeah. And, and these are broadly consistent with that net zero goal by, uh, by 2050 that, that we have in the UK. But the, these system scenarios, uh, they, they give us a good high level view, but they are quite limited. A lot of them tend to be quite electrical focused. Uh, they lack granularity, uh, don't always bring into, uh, take into account uh, consumer demand. Uh, they're not very good at characterizing all the technologies uh, sufficiently. And I think of especially energy storage within that, so they can uh, think about supply and demand, but a lot of these intermediate technologies aren't very well represented uh, and at the same time the, the, there's a lot of uncertainty in how these uh, scenarios will develop and I've put in you know for example uh, different market reforms or for us uh, Brexit and uh, what impact that might have. So although there's a lot of system scenarios yeah, they, they don't adequately describe how storage might develop over these timescales as well. But from our analysis, then, we, we can see that, that there will be this need for flexibility generally, and, and that flexibility spans multiple timescales uh, from seconds uh, out to months, seasons, and uh, in, indeed years as well, as, as we look at how both the supply side and the demand side uh, will be changing the supply side with uh, variable renewables on the demand side as we integrate electric vehicles and heat pumps that are using electricity uh, as well. So I, I won't go through through all of these, but it really shows this increasing need for flexibility. And of course, you know, we, we see that energy storage emerging as one of those uh, sort of key ways that can provide that flexibility that is dropping off the system uh, as we lose that uh, sort of generation from responsive plant uh, like uh, like like gas uh, in the UK or uh, other fuels in 
in other countries. I'm sure it's it's quite a familiar feature. Uh, and and then we we would look at the different technologies that are available uh, to provide energy storage. And again, I, I won't go through the, the full set of analysis here, but you know, understanding that there are different families of technologies uh, that provide energy storage services, uh, mechanical through to uh, electrical and, and chemical and, and thermal storage uh, technologies, uh, and that they can be integrated across the system at different points as well. It could be uh, on the network at different levels, on the demand side behind the meter, say in our homes or factories, or on the supply side uh, alongside generation itself. I think it's, it's really important to understand the energy service demand uh, as, as we move towards net zero, uh, whether that's you know, providing, you can see here, uh, reserve, uh, services and ancillary services for frequency control, uh, black start, uh, and uninterruptible power supplies, uh, deferring upgrades, and so on. And, and understand uh, what different technologies can meet those different services. Uh, and we can construct yeah, a, a diagram similar to, yeah, I'm sure what you've seen before, uh, the different technologies and how, how long they can discharge for uh, and in this, uh, we're looking at the technological maturity of, of different technologies. So uh, I've placed on, on here uh, you know, what, what's available at the moment uh, to provide electricity, thermal or longer duration storage in, in terms of uh, the fuels that, that we're used to, coal or gas or other fossil fuels, uh, oil. Uh, and you know, within this, we, we see uh, especially a gap at the medium to long duration storage uh, that is provided by fossil fuel at the moment that we uh, clearly have to uh, run down. So, so there's a bit of a gap in, in the technology space. Uh, and you know, we, we can look specifically at the scenarios for, for storage and how they've developed. Uh, I, I won't run through these, but um, if we look back at the first scenarios in 2017 from the national grid, they were looking at a capacity of about 10 gigawatts within, within the UK, starting from where we are now at about 3 gigawatts. Uh, over subsequent years, this, uh, uh, this estimate of how much storage we'll need has increased and increased. I'll just jump on to the, uh, well, one of the most recent ones in 2022. And so if you remember back, it was like 10 gigawatts. Now that the scenarios are saying it could be between, uh, well, up to 50 gigawatts uh, to 30 gigawatts in these scenarios that, that are meeting net zero. So massive increases uh, that, that will be needed to provide that sort of flexibility. I'll just jump through this. So um, I'm just coming to the end then. So that, that's a bit of the analysis that helped inform uh, what we put into the roadmap. Uh, and the roadmap itself was uh, understanding three different periods where there will be energy system change, what that means for storage, and uh, the implications for the research and innovation priorities. So if we look back at uh, when we first developed this, uh, this roadmap in 2020, we could see a growth in variable renewables, increasing a need for ancillary services, and that storage would have that potential to provide that quick response. Um, and batteries are available and providing that in, in some sectors. And the research and innovation then is needed to you know, understand the degradation and strengthen that, uh, that base. If we look then uh, a bit later at, at the time through the 2020s, uh, as there's a higher proportion of renewables and, and we see now about 40% of generation coming from uh, renewables uh, for electricity, uh, and an increasing take up of electric vehicles and the potential for storage changes. It becomes more about the medium duration and thinking about how we might be uh, aggregating electric vehicle batteries together. So the sorts of research and innovation priorities are you know, focusing around the market and regulatory reform uh, to value storage so it can come through into the market. Uh, and we need to be acting now to understand yeah, the, the sort of longer duration storage, how we invest in manufacturing and what policies and uh, regulation is needed in, in the future. 
And finally, looking at uh, the, the later part of this decade, uh, where we'll be expecting to decarbonize heat through, through heat pumps, um, and uh, the transport system gets ever more decarbonized through electric vehicles, uh, we'll see the storage potential you know, expand into especially uh, the thermal side uh, and you know, maybe the, the battery and second life uh, side of uh, electric vehicles. And this is on top uh, of that longer, medium and longer duration storage that, that we highlighted earlier. So the research and innovation then think about environmental impacts of storage as the deployment increases. Uh, and we need to be thinking about the sort of seasonal timescales, uh, circular economy aspects. So that's, you know, we're careful about resources uh, and uh, making sure that we integrate heat into all our systems thinking uh, as well. So that's a quick rundown uh, of, of some of the key points. Uh, the roadmap itself was launched in December 2020. Uh, I won't go, I won't take you there right now, maybe maybe later I'll just flash that up, but, but you can uh, find it uh, at this website and it's being maintained uh, through the next iteration of the Supergen uh, Network Plus there. Uh, an infographic, uh, again, which, yeah, um, to sort of set sets out those recommendations uh, and sort of conclusions. Again, I'll, I'll just uh, skip through those. I've covered most of those points here, but we can come back to them in the in the discussion. And yeah, thanks uh, thanks for listening. Thanks to my former colleagues for uh, yeah supporting the development of that. And yeah, look forward to any questions and, and hearing from them. Okay, many thanks, Jonathan. It was a very nice overview, and it's obvious how much work uh, was put into, into the whole study, so many thanks. Um, again, to the audience, uh, feel free, you can uh, write the questions already into the chat, or you wait until Wim has finished, and then maybe there are even questions which are um, pointing on both uh, um, uh, of the speakers, and then we can answer together. So, Wim, I go directly to you. Um, the stage is yours. Thank you, Stephanie, for your kind introduction. Yes, uh, the second part of this on seminar is on the Dutch roadmap for energy storage. And uh, as, as an offspring of that, uh, the international comparison that I made of the Dutch thermal energy storage R&D scene. So let's start with uh, a broad view on the content. Uh, First nine slides will be on the Dutch roadmap because um, it's it's uh, is, is the basis for the research that I did. Uh, you hear something about the background and the first steps of the the roadmap, uh, how it is constructed, and what are the follow up activities. And then the second part will be aimed at um, showing you what um, say the position is of Dutch R and D um, therm on thermal energy storage. So the Dutch Energy Storage Policy Roadmap was um, committed, commissioned uh, in, in September 23, when the Minister of uh, Climate Affairs and Energy decided to set up this roadmap. Um, the background was that, for that was that um, he felt that, that actions were needed to stimulate energy storage and that uh, uh, we need to have a, a good view on the role of energy storage in the future energy system and then aim it at a horizon 2035 and later, so medium and long term. Uh, background also was that there are deepening challenges with the electricity grid congestion. So the electricity grid in the Netherlands is um, uh, it's at, at its uh, top capacity. Therefore, a lot of industries don't get new um, connection to the grid, and this is causing a lot of uh, also economical um, problems and challenges. And then also the Dutch government uh, um, decided to step out of natural gas. The um, domestic natural gas production was stopped uh, last year. And uh, also because of the crisis, the Ukraine crisis, uh, we had to step out an uh, accelerated way. So then there's a, a flexibility challenge with, uh, with the energy system. We have more and more var variable renewable energy sources. 
and they uh, are being curbed at, at the moment. And therefore, the business cases of these renewable energy sources are getting worse. Um, and this containment, but also demand side with response measures, can only do a partly the job in uh, balancing the supply and demand of, uh, of uh, in energy, electricity in, in special. Um, and therefore, story, storage is, is clearly a, a key enabler for cost and energy efficient transition. But uh, the big question is who pays for the storage? Um, who gets the profit of it? How much storage do we need? And how do we organize uh, all these uh, storage technologies to be implemented in the, in the next uh, period? So we, we came up with the energy storage road, roadmap, which is a national ex exercise. Um, three forms of energy were um, addressed. The orange one is the, the heat, going from heat sources to, uh, to houses, to offices, and to uh, factories. And then the second um, factor is, is electricity, going to all the sectors. And the third vector is molecules. Um, say in a fully renewable world, this would be mainly hydrogen being the source of other uh, molecules, uh, hydrocarbons, that can either be used in other sectors or can be exported. And uh, here to the right again, say there was a loudening call for attention to storage due to the energy price hikes and due to grid congestion. And the minister agreed to request for a storage roadmap. And he, he was decided to broaden the scope to all storage technologies, so not just electricity. So what did the roadmap intend to achieve and what didn't it attempt to achieve? In green, the, uh, the DIT, uh, so it did analyze the, the current state of play in the Netherlands and gave again general uh, overview of trends. So an inventory is made of actions that can speed up the implementation of storage uh, with the horizon 2035. And it also uh, positions storage in a wider policy context. So um, it will be implemented and be part of the national plan for the 2050 uh, energy system in the Netherlands. It didn't choose between storage technologies. So it, um, uh, it's neutral to the technologies and also no quantitative goals were set for the implementation of specific technologies because this will be uh, future work uh, done in uh, the context of the national plan for the energy system. But this is just one page uh, from, from the roadmap. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's only in, in Dutch. So um, um, we have to translate a little bit here. We can see in blue is the electricity uh, storage, in green the molecule storage, and in orange the heat storage. And then it's uh, being determined between different functionalities. So functionalities for um, matching supply and demand of energy, uh, functionality of uh, grid support, functionality of um, um, decreasing the net congestion. And another functionality is the strategic uh, stock of uh, fuel that is needed to overcome crisis situations. And then for every technology, the ERL is given, and then also which um, functionality this kind of storage technology can be applied best. So they provide complementarity uh, on different uh, timescales, uh, and uh, each type of technology also encompasses a broad spectrum of technologies. And some technologies are commercially available and some are in the RD&D phase. So now the, the roadmap was set up and further steps for this roadmap is that there is a list of actions for the, for the ministry uh, and also for the professional organizations in the field and for the enterprise agency, the Dutch enterprise agencies to further work on quantifications to do further studies into integration and into financing and other topics, to work on technology descriptions and also to work on technology roadmaps. So specifically for electricity, for molecule and thermal storage. And part of the thermal storage roadmap is also an assessment study that was done by me on the status of the Dutch thermal energy storage R&D in international context. 
For more on this uh, study, the goal of the international assessment is to determine the state of development of Dutch um, thermal energy storage technologies in relation to other countries. So the main questions would be uh, in what technologies is the Netherlands forerunner? Which application areas are possible? What are the opportunities for foreign collaboration? Which policies are needed to accelerate or to keep the forerunner position if we have one? The, the study was ordered by the Netherlands Enterprise Agency together with the top sector of uh, knowledge, for knowledge and innovation on urban energy. And what's very uh, important is to see and to know that the application of thermal energy storage is for the built environment only. So we didn't look specifically to other sectors like industry. So the first step was to uh, make a division into the thermal energy storage technologies that would be looked at. We have uh, seven categories. So uh, the first is sensible decentralized uh, storage in water. So boilers with uh, small volumes. Then the second category is the aquifer thermal energy storage. Then the third is sensible central storage. So the large thermal energy storage technologies like pit, tank, borehole, storage, then high temperature sensible storage, either in solids or liquids at higher temperatures, phase change materials, thermochemical storage, and uh, iron redox um, reactions, or iron fuel, also called. And the last one, uh, last one is uh, rather a strange uh, part, because um, initially and mainly it is um, being developed and applied for industrial applications, but there also are also some plans to apply it for district heating. So what was done to make an, um, a view of the R&D organization and the R&D work uh, in other countries, uh, we used some sources. The uh, sources were the two IEA uh, energy storage tasks either on large, large thermal energy storage, task 39, which is now task 45, or the task 40 on compact thermal energy storage. Then we also used input of the Dutch stakeholder group. This is a representative group of people uh, professionally uh, involved into thermal energy storage, either in research development or in industry. And uh, we came up with a long list of organizations uh, in, in uh, different countries, 78 organizations in 15 countries that were investigated in short. And then we made an overview of uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, um, the main, how do you say, uh, achievements of, of every uh, group and, uh, and uh, say uh, a categorization of, of all the uh, in institutes. Uh, here are two lists for, for uh, first list left for all the research and development institutes working on boilers and, and tanks, so for water storage, and to the right for aquifer thermal energy storage. Just to have a, an idea of uh, uh, the lists. And then the, the PCM and the TCM list uh, to the left and right respectively a longer list because these lists are more into the research and development um, area, which more institutes are uh, involved. We also made a country description. So looked at uh, different countries that uh, had a lot of uh, activities, uh, R&D activities in thermal energy storage. And they made a description very general on what the say typical aspects on thermal energy storage R&D were for the different countries. So three examples for this. But Denmark can be categorized or identified as a learning school for pit thermal energy storage. The background is that already in the 90s, uh, there was a taxation of natural gas in, in Denmark. And this was the basis for a better competitive position for solar thermal in combination with pit thermal energy storage to have seasonal so solar thermal for, uh, for district heating systems. Another aspect that helped uh, be becoming a learning school is that district heating grids are largely owned by cooperatives. So they uh, enable um, um, better sharing of results and performances. And this, in its turn, 
accelerates the development of the pit thermal energy storage technology. Finally, it could be said that uh, the research on, on TESS is on a broad range and that there's also a large product development activities with industry, so in combination between research and development and industry. The R&D funding for TESS is on a high level, but we have seen that uh, in, in the past periods, there's a strong variation uh, through the years in the height of the R&D funding. The development also uh, takes a long time from a real, um, say, first idea to the product on the market. An example is the Zeolite dishwasher that was developed by ZRE Bayern, which took about 15 years between the, the first idea and the, the market, market uptake. And then um, also it is shown that um, Germany follows the Netherlands in, in two parts um, on the high temperature um, uh, ATES, sorry, on the ATES, not high temperature, I have to correct that. So on the aquifer thermal energy storage and on the iron fuel. And then uh, the third country that is highlighted here is uh, Switzerland, that can be characterized by its uh, program to poach. An example for the program to poach is uh, the long running RD program uh, under the Swiss Competence Center for Thermal Energy Storage, the CCTES. And this uh, competence center serves as a, a, a very broad and solid basis of infrastructure, measurement infrastructure, but also of experts, so a knowledge pool um, that also, um, I would say, are the basis for spin-off companies. So how are the Netherlands doing? The basis for, for this um, assessment is the, the own experience, and also the results of a short inquiry that was held under international experts from the, the tasks and from the broader group. So 250 inquiries were sent out and 56 were returned. And the inquiry was rather short, only three questions. The first question in, in which uh, area, so uh, R&D area, the expert is, um, is active and is seen as most important. So in the dimension of the technology, is it latent, PCM, PCM or chemical? And in the dimension of application fields, so is to technology for domestic application, for industrial application, for district heating and cooling, or for power. And the second question uh, is about which institute or organization would the expert see as leading in this uh, area? And a third question, if possible, a name a Dutch organization that is working on this area. So in this way, we get, um, say, a non-biased um, view on the, um, say, the, the level of expertise that is being evaluated by foreign experts. For the results of the inquiry, just in short, on Tensible, on PCM and on TCM technology. For Tensible, there were 26 reactions, for PCM, 22, and for uh, TCM, 18 reactions. And then there was a weight uh, uh, I would say, valuation of the different institutes. And for Sensible, it was uh, plan energy from the from Denmark, was seen as the institute with the highest expertise, then the Intech from, from Austria, and then Solitas from, from Germany. And this was uh, mainly on the uh, large thermal energy storage area. The top institutes that were viewed here in this area for Sensible was TNO with nine votes and IF technology with uh, five votes. For PCM, there were 22 reactions. Farno for ESA was seen nice. as the top institute for that application area. On the second place, DLR from Germany, and the third place, University of Lieda with 1.9 points. And TNO with 11 votes and of a university with four votes was, was seen as institutes that were active on PCM in the Netherlands. Then for TCM, the Eindhoven University was seen as the top institute, Lieda in Spain as the second one, and DLR in Germany as the third one. And uh, in this area, also TU Eindhoven and TNO were seen as institutes that are active in this area. So the results of the inquiry were used also to, uh, together with the uh, view on the R&D status in, the, in, the, in the, the other countries, 
to give a, 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 an evaluation of the strength of the Dutch R&D. So from the inquiry, it was seen that we are strong in the thermochemical materials. You end over the scene as the front runner. And then if technology and Tino you know, are internationally known as uh, aquifer experts. From the analysis, uh, it is been seen that uh, we have a relatively weak position in phase change material. So there are manufacturers uh, active in the Netherlands and also bringing products on the market, but there's not a much that much R&D uh, ongoing. And that the Netherlands has a front runner position in aquifer and in DCM and also in iron fuel. So what are the policies for the application areas and for international collaborations? So on a decentral uh, technology level, um, it would be good to enter the German market uh, because the market is large. And it has also high quality manufacturing industry and use the German experience also in collaboration projects because they have a lot of experience in solar thermal boilers or normal boilers. And then further strengthen the TCM and R&D in international networks uh, on materials and components work because it requires a lot of research that cannot be borne by one country alone. For central storage technologies, uh, it's good to acquire knowledge on pit thermal energy and tank thermal energy storage from Denmark and from Germany because they have a leading position on these technologies and the technologies also have a good uh, potential in the Netherlands. And there's a good um, opportunity to, act, to export knowledge, but also system uh, and components of aquifer thermal energy storage to countries like uh, Germany, Belgium, and France. And uh, it's also good to increase the knowledge of uh, high temperature sensible uh, storage through collaborations with uh, especially Germany and Spain, because a lot of Knowledge has been generated there that can be also used in the Netherlands. So what would be the policy to uh, have the front runner roles for aquifer and iron fuels? Um, support for knowledge export would be good, and especially if this is coupled to projects with uh, Dutch partners. Thermochemical materials uh, to initiate, uh, initiate international collaboration. And pay attention to initiating uh, spin-offs, giving uh, long-term support would be very important. In general, uh, to generate a strong internal market through dedicated support for innovative test projects. So we're making sure that there is a, a good market. And also to accelerate the development through a broad, long-term programmatic R&D approach, like is done, for instance, in Switzerland with the CCTS, as you heard earlier, or for Spain with the Institute CEC in the Basque country. The conclusions from the research is that the uh, Netherlands play a good role in the national, international R&D for test technologies, that we have a front-runner role in aquifer and also in iron fuel, uh, that we are front-runner in TCM, at least internationally seen as a front-runner, and that uh, the the strengthening of the R&D field uh, is needed through international collaboration and through long-term programmatic approach. And that also strengthening of the markets, that market is necessary by targeted subsidies for innovative debt products. So if you have reactions or questions, they are very welcome. In the final version, I will also put some links so that you can find also the links to the roadmap and to my research. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much, Wim. Also for you, <clears throat> it's visible how much work uh, went into the study. Um, I think it's interesting to see, uh, let's say, the two different approaches and um, 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 re general questions that they came up uh, during your both work and what you uh, answered. Um, so to the audience, I saw there was a question in between. I didn't want to interrupt, but if now the person wants to ask uh, again, just go ahead. Okay, maybe it was answered. <laughs> um, then Jonathan, I thought that you wrote in the chat, you wanted to show a version. 
Uh, your microphone is off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm afraid it looks like there, there might be a problem with the server. Uh, maybe someone hasn't paid paid the bill or something. But I've got a cast version of the of the roadmap that I can just show you from. Yes, please. Yeah. Is, is that is that appearing? Yeah. Yes. Right. So this is what, in principle, you, you should be able to see uh, if you go to that web link uh, up, up here. Um, so it's uh, the, the roadmap itself is structured, as you can see in these different chapters, looking at the system, the role for storage, the different technologies, uh, and some of the innovation challenges. Um, so I, I, th I was quite pleased with it, with how it turned out. We we, we had a, a publishing company uh, do that for us. Um, so hopefully it's, it's quite accessible. We look at uh, storage itself. First of all, looking at the role for it, uh, the, the current conventional stored energy that, that we have on the system, which I think is really informative. Uh, and then uh, just scrolling down some of the uh, current deployment of, uh, of batteries in the UK and, and where they are, the different facilities. Uh, and uh, maybe through to the um, sort of innovation challenges uh, as well. So looking at the different research outputs. So taking a bit of a global view uh, about where the research is being conducted and and in what areas. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully that that'll be up and and running a bit before too long, uh, and you'll be able to see see what's going on there. Yes, but many thanks to give a few what what to expect. I think it uh, looks very, as I said, very accessible. So it's very well structured, <laughs> not getting lost in hundreds of pages of information, but getting easy what you need to know. Um, thanks again. And do we have any question? Uh, you can write into the chat or ask directly. Um, I know on the list of participants that there are some some experts also working in uh, thermal energy storage. So uh, <laughs> it would, would be very welcome to get some reactions on uh, whether they see this, they have the same view. Uh, or, uh, yes, even if it's a different view, I guess it's a yes, very it valued good. information. If someone says it's uh, something is out of the range or whatever, yeah. Um, okay, so I maybe take the chance and ask you something. I uh, know oh, we have one. Please then. Hi. Um, yeah, another question to Wim actually, but to, to Jonathan, um, because uh, you presented uh, uh, the roadmap of 2020, but I was wondering whether you could say a word on on updates that are that are coming. Uh, I think you you mentioned that it's being updated, but is it like uh, is the idea to have a let's say a, a really new structure in in the the new update with a new goals or is it just basically updating the graphs with the new year uh, of data um yeah so so we're just revising it at the moment and hopefully release it at, at the end of this year um yeah so so it'll be sort of, it, it's reviewing how the system scenarios have maybe evolved over the last few years uh, and if there have been any big changes there I, I think to be honest it, it'll be fairly incremental uh, mm. in terms of things because uh, yeah we we've been on this path uh, for quite a while uh, maybe uh, well also updating some of the te technology advances uh, and what stage they're at that that's more likely to have changed especially the uh, the cost and performance of different technologies has evolved mm. quite a lot and uh, to be fair, in the UK, uh, the government has been putting a lot more investment into uh, the research and innovation side of storage. Uh, so giving a uh, a more complete overview about what is going going on on that side of things. Uh, I, I think it, it might be interesting if we get um, to the results of the election over the next uh, few weeks in, in the UK, uh, potentially the Labour Party, who could form the, the, the next government, uh, would have... Uh, a more accelerated view of how the electricity system would, would decarbonize and that would have a bigger impact on you know what technologies are, are needed to uh yeah to enable that can, thanks Jonathan. can i make one follow-up question there stephanie yeah because sure. <laughs> i was uh thinking and uh in terms of answering my own question a little bit uh, or at least um expanding on it a bit further uh, do you uh, I, I see a lot is on uh, electricity storage and on on, on batteries. Uh, do you expect that in the new version there's 
gonna be more attention to a longer duration storage types and maybe also uh, thermal storage options or how, how do you see the, the the place of this in the context of this roadmap yeah so so the, the roadmap does does have a lot on the sort of longer duration and, and thermal storage I mean the, and and those we expect to become more important uh first of all as uh the the uh portion of electricity being generated increases from renewables and that'll put more need for uh medium and longer duration storage as we get through the 2030s and towards net zero electricity and then as we decarbonize the heating which we have uh, which is provided mostly by gas as that transitions probably through the 2030s um, there'll be a need for thermal energy storage. But you know, what, what we recognize is that the, the need for storage, thermal storage, for example, comes in the 2030s. And what we highlight in this roadmap is that we need to be developing uh, those technologies now so that we're ready in the 2030s for them to be available. And, and the same for medium duration. It's, it's about trying to be ahead of the curve mm. and recognizing how the system will change because if we get to you know, the, the late uh, 2020s or 2030s and we don't have that technology in place, then, then we'll just rely on, on the existing fossil fuel, essentially, to, to provide those services. So it's really trying to highlight what we need to be doing in advance of those system needs. That's a clear message. Thanks, Sir John. Thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> do we have any further questions? Okay, so I I might go ahead and ask one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There was uh, do you Wim? Um, because with Jonathan, I thought that he mentioned different scenarios just shortly, but you can correct me if I got it wrong. But I was wondering how uh, did you also think about different um scenarios? I don't know if I say it long enough. Probably pronounce it very German, <laughs> but a different, uh, um, yeah, uh, um, options of future. Let's say they could be like, for example, if it stays very um, conservative, or if it stays very fossil fuel um, focused, or if it stays very open to renewable, something like this. How the impact would be, and if you maybe have to change the direction on your roadmap as well. Yeah, uh, I guess that this that will be one of the next steps. Uh, the energy plan for 2050 will give a basis for that. And in the energy plan, there will be also scenarios, so different possibilities, depending on how the uh, say global situation will will accelerate or will, will move from one end to the other. And then uh, on basis of that, there will be uh, made uh, some uh, different choices for the different technologies. So um, this this will be then future work for the next steps. Okay, I see. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, Jonathan, I hope I got it right that within your work, you already had uh, this, the few point, uh, different few points. Yeah, that's right. We, we were looking at different scenarios for how the system could develop and then trying to yeah uh, integrate those into what the role of storage could be that would yeah, meet those different uh, possible future needs. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. I can imagine that this is a crucial part to think about because it makes, as you showed nicely in the beginning, the map with the different ways, <laughs> um, there are different <laughs> roadmaps. And I think it, this is at the end, um, the more you think about the different scenarios, the better you are prepared then in the future to make decisions. So even though it's difficult to know what happens, I think it's an important part Yes. So, and yeah, well, we have to understand the level of uncertainty in, in a lot yes. of this. Uh, Absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, very interesting. Um, do we have any further question to um, to the two speakers? Okay, I think today we have a very shy uh, audience. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, but... Um, Nevertheless, I am very, very happy that you two gave the talk. And um, I think it's a lot to to learn about how different approaches can be done and how much effort is to put in to get an idea about what is the current state and what could be in the future. So many thanks for presenting. Um,